Firstly, um, thank you for taking the opportunity to uh, be here today. Um, and also I'd like to thank um, Leanne, the Mayor and Roger for their opening comments and probably just a past comment that um, between the pair of them they seem to have covered most of the things I was going to briefly introduce today anyway. So there goes everything I was going to say but I will touch on a couple of points and I suppose I'm sort of coming in here in my role um, as being responsible for the City Council's district plan and our long term planning framework. Probably a couple of things and I will build on what Leanne and Roger have both said and the, the first is that we are a country that lives with large amounts of risks and hazard. You only have to think about our own circumstances to recognise that all of our major centres um, have developed in areas where there are significant risks. And that's historical because we've all, we've grown, we, we developed as a European country at least, um, based on initially sea transport. So collectively we've grown most of our major cities on coastal margins on estuaries, on rivers, um, and as a consequence, we live with risk. Equally, as Roger pointed out, the places we go to to live because we find them desirable to live in are also often associated with high levels of risk. We like to live on hilltops. We like the views that go with them. We like to live at the edge of water bodies because we like to swim or because we like to see the very pleasant river flowing by. But inherently, those come with some risks. And I reflected last night about my own um, history. Um, I grew up in Auckland in the shadow of, what, seven volcanoes, of which at least a number of them are still active. I moved to Wellington and lived with the earthquake risk associated with living in Wellington or the flood risk in the Hutt River associated with living in the Hutt Valley. From there I went to Napier and lived with, um, I suppose again, the, the legacy of the 1931 earthquake and lived through the, um, the, the effects of Cyclone Bowler in the early 80s. I then subsequently went to Hamilton, and while that didn't seem to have a lot of risk, the first year we were there, the Waikato River had a 100-year flood, broke its banks and flooded half the suburbs on the western side of the city. And then I moved to Christchurch, where I thought, well, actually, that's probably relatively safe. Uh, and suddenly we had earthquakes and, most recently, this flooding. So apart from that suggestion that I might be a bad penny that roams the country trailing risk, I suppose what I'm trying to say is, in various ways, we all experience risk as we go. Uh, Leanne and her comments made it very clear. We are in the process, in the, through the district plan and through a lot of the things the council does, about trying to understand the level of risk and manage the framework and the regulatory and planning frameworks going forward and in the case of the district plan, going 20 to 30 years forward in a way that makes sense to people's lives, allows people to make choices about how they live within a framework that acknowledges the hazards that we have and tries to create a tolerable amount of risk uh, in terms of the decisions that are made. In planning speak, we talk of the hierarchy of principles, avoid, remedy or mitigate. It's very easy to avoid if you have full understanding and you can make choices. And the events of the earthquake will no doubt really and significantly impact on our choices about where we allow people in the future to develop on our port hills and on the coastal margins. That's not so easy where we've got existing development. So we are very much in that instance in the case of focusing on what is the risk what is the tolerable level of risk? What's the cost effectiveness of living with that risk and managing that going forward? Because what we need to do is we need to create communities that people can afford to be part of while keeping that level of, I suppose, risk contained in a way that allows us for most of our lives to live safe, happy lives. And again, I, I note what um, Leanne said, as we go about our daily life, we don't tend to think about those risks. We assume that people have made those decisions for us. And in part, that is the role that council plays. We, on behalf of the community, try to balance those different drivers to create what we think is the best scenario going forward for people to live in. And that scenario is based on the level of information we have. No one, and certainly my role and the council's role, is not to allow people to live with un unnecessary or unwarrantable levels of, of risk. It is to create a, a, fr a framework that allows people to do so
in a safe and resilient manner. So our focus going forward from the events that we've had in the past years, from the body of knowledge that's building, projecting that forward and saying, in that environment, with that level of, I suppose, cost versus benefit, what is the right set of regulatory drivers that we will have to allow people's um, development in the city? It's about creating resilience. It's about creating a sustainable city going forward with the best knowledge that we have. But it's also about ensuring that people have opportunities to live, because we can't all live in such cotton wool environments that we have no opportunity at all. So I think I'm the I'm the very much the intro technical speaker. I might pass directly over at this point to Peter Kingsbury, who is the principal advisor on natural uh, resources for the council, and he'll start the the technical sessions for you. Thank you very much. Okay. Those are the topics I'm going to cover. Now, this is, given the time that I've got, I'm, I'm just going to be able to touch on some of these things today. So don't feel as though, hopefully you won't feel as though it's incomplete. But I just want to get us across some really important concepts and ideas. The, the first one, and that's the list of the things I'm going to talk about there. Natural events. They can be divided into two main areas, geological and weather-related events, and you can see those listed there. I'm going to touch, just touch on some of these today. What's important about these things is, is the word natural events. These are natural processes which happen, have happened in the past, happen today, and will continue to happen in the future. They are not freaks of nature. They are not acts of God. They are not unforeseen circumstances. They are none of those things that you have ever read in the small print on your insurance policies. They are simply natural events, and I'm going to come back to that in a, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Do you recognise that? No, you don't. Not unless you were here about 160 years ago. These are events that have happened before. This is an earthquake which impacted on Christchurch in its very early days. Looks very familiar, doesn't it? Those are the ground-shaking intensities of an earthquake back in the 1860s. Earthquakes create a whole lot of different effects. Obviously, ground-shaking is one of them. There's liquefaction, there's slope instability, and a range of other effects as well. If one good thing has come out of the earthquakes in Christchurch, it's this. People can now both pronounce and, and spell liquefaction complete, um, properly. That was always a problem pre-September um, 2010. And liquefaction is not what you see in the street. That is simply the silt in the water. Liquefaction is the process by which that silt and water reaches the surface. Here's a nice example of that. A cross-section. We've seen it in the streets, we know what it looks like, but have you ever seen it in cross-section? Now the point of this slide is not to give you a technical analysis of liquefaction, it's to say that there is historic evidence, geological evidence, of liquefaction having happened in Christchurch before. So this is just to try and reinforce the importance of that idea that these events that have happened before and will continue to happen in the future. Again, on that same point, did we know about liquefaction before the earthquakes in Christchurch or the Canterbury earthquakes? Yes, we did. Right from back in the uh, 1980s, that uh, report cover there on the slide touched on some of the very first mapping of liquefaction in Christchurch. More recently, about 10 to 15 years ago, ECAM produced a series of maps and other information about liquefaction in Christchurch. So really, Liquefaction, although it's a relatively new concept technically from about the 60s or the 70s, it's always been a problem here and will continue to be a problem in the future. And the question that people often ask is, because we've had liquefaction now, does that mean to say it won't happen again in future earthquakes? That is not the case at all. Sorry, that is the case. It will happen again. And that we've experienced that even between the 2010 and the 2011 earthquakes. This is a, this is a very important map. At the moment, we're very interested, particularly in 
the sequence of earthquakes that we've had. The sequence of earthquakes we've had have been from very local sources, one not quite so local, but one very local to the city. This map shows the combination of all the earthquake sources in and near, in near Christchurch. So it takes into account the Alpine Fault, it takes into account our, our more regional fault lines like the Porter's Pass Fault and others like that. So when we were thinking about the earthquake hazard, we can't just think about what has happened in recent time. There are many other sources of earthquakes in, in and around Canterbury which are likely to impact on Christchurch. I can I'm not going to go into the detail of this at the moment, but I hope you just get the idea that there are multiple sources of earthquakes, all of which can impact Christchurch in various ways. Tsunami, and I'm only putting up the slide to introduce the topic, and, for Ma and Marion's going to talk in more detail about this to you very shortly. Again, slope stability, you're going to hear a lot more about that um, from some of the other speakers. Flood hazard. Two points here. One is that there are two sources of flood hazard for Christchurch. There is our local source, which we're all very, uh, local sources, our Avon and Hethcot and other streams, something that we're very familiar with in the last couple of weeks. But there's also the Waimakariri River as well. The talk today from Graham Harrington and Mike Galuli is, is going to concentrate much more on the local flooding, but it's very important to realise that although there's been a lot of mitigation work done with the Waimak River, Waimakariri River, it is still a threat, but I would consider significantly less of a threat now than what some of our local flooding is. Weather events. Uh, 1992, 92 snowstorm event. I wasn't living in Christchurch at that stage. We've had a couple since then. These are events that we're going to continue to have, and with climate change, we're likely to see more of these and more extreme events as well. Coastal processes. I'm sure that many of you have walked along um, this part of Sumner. That's the large photo there in black and white. Someone said to me, oh, so what year was that tsunami? Now that's not a tsunami at all, that's a, high, a, very, um, that's a storm surge breaking over that, um, that concrete wall that you walk along and that building is where the tea rooms now is at that, that end. So this just goes to hopefully show you we are very interested in these extreme events. We often get high, we get a tide cycle every day, but those, those tide cycles do not impact on us. It's the extremes of those events which are really important in terms of the way that we manage them and the damage and the consequences of them. That top slide, the colour one, shows the breaching of the dune in, um, by, by the library back in uh, about 12 years ago, I think it is. So we're still tending to occupy, well we are still occupying, and we're still developing some of these coastal areas which are at threat. Again, coastal processes, I particularly like the slide of the spit. But what that diagram shows, it shows the changes in the, in the position of the spit, or the shape of the spit, over about the last 150 or so years. We live in a very dynamic environment. Things are constantly changing. So the, the experiences that we've had over the last three or four years, and more recently with the flooding, we're going to see that in a whole lot of other natural processes as well, with storm surges and over a greater length of time with sea level. Sea level changes. Right, a little bit about terminology. If we're to understand natural hazards and the effects on them, we, we need to understand what the terms mean. And we tr need to try and talk the same language. If we don't do that, it's very hard to communicate the ideas. Now, I think Humpty Dumpty had a little bit of a bad attitude towards um, terminology, but we, we tried to be a little bit uh, better than that. Key terms. Natural events, natural hazards, natural disasters and risks, they all mean different things. And the literature is spiked with a whole lot of loose language around these terms. Um, we, we see terms being used in the newspaper, 
um, which create confusion. Uh, we, we, hear, we hear things spoken about on, on the TV news about risk and return periods. Creates a lot of confusion. So there's a real need for, for people to be prepared to try and understand the, the terminology and for the councils and the other organisations involved in natural hazards to put the effort in to trying to get across some of these concepts. Natural events. As I said before, they're natural processes. They're not acts of God or anything like that. Um, the natural events include climate-related, as I've already said, so the, uh, the geological ones, but also biological ones, but we're not going to be touching on those today. I think if there's anything that you go away with today, it would be understanding this diagram here. Firstly, we are interested in the extremes of natural events. As I said, the tide comes in and, each, in and out each day twice, or however many times it does. The sun rises and, and sets every day. But it's the extremes of those events which impact on us. At the other, on the other side of this diagram, we occupy, Christ, we occupy part of the Canterbury Plains. We live here. We carry out our activities here. Now, when those two things interact, that is when you have the potential for a natural hazard to occur. If we weren't living on floodplains and it flooded, there'd be no impacts or consequences because we're not there. Even if we weren't farm, if we were farming there, yes, there would be impacts and consequences. So it's that coming together, that intersection of our activities and where we live with these events which creates the hazard. This is a really nice quote, <laughs> going right back to 19, 1928, one of the very early um, uh, engineers of, uh, in Christchurch. Christchurch won't be a worthy city until we tame the WIMAC. That in itself smacks of something that we now know we can't do. It's not about taming nature, it's about living with it and accepting the consequences. Natural disasters, this is when the rubber hits the road or the event hits us, there is deaths, there are dollar damages and all those sorts of other consequences that we're really familiar with. Disasters range from being a nuisance that you can't maybe, that you get your feet wet walking up your driveway because the local river's flooded, to being a catastrophe when people are killed or injured or, or there's great property damage. So there's a whole range of, of terms or understandings of what natural disasters actually are. The point I'd make about this one is that um, we, we are normally not particularly interested in these events until they impact us. How many times have you said or you've heard someone say, I love li living next to the river, I have nice views, my kids can go and play in the river, and you say, do you feel at risk from flooding? No, no, it's all fine, I accept that. But the day that water enters their house, it's the responsibility normally of someone else. So we value, we value living next to the river, we value living next to the coast or on the hills where we have our have our nice views, but at the same time we must realise that there is a downside to that, infrequent as it may be. I'm just going to touch briefly on risk, and this is a topic that um, Tony Tague is going to touch, touch on in a little bit more detail. There's two main, if you look at it in a, in a very mathematical way, there are two parts to risk. There's the probability of an event happening and our exposure to it. And it's the combination of those that gives the level of risk. And I could give you any number of examples around the different permutations and combinations of that. A little, a, a slightly more subtle definition of of risk is that it's the chance of something happening that will impact on some of our objectives. So what is it that we're trying to do or achieve? What is it that we want from living in an area? And what is the probability that we're not going to be able to achieve those objectives or that those objectives will be affected in some way? So it, it, it's a, it's a, it can be quite difficult even for technical people to get their heads around risk 
but hopefully from the, from the uh, introductions you've had today and what you're going to hear later on, you'll, you'll leave today with a better understanding of what your exposure may be to various natural processes and what can be done about it. Just one comment, and, and I was going to mention this earlier uh, under, the, under the earthquake um, presentation, or under the earthquake slide, side, is that generally natural process or, or natural events, they are ran statistically, they are random events. But we do, statistically, we can put return periods on them. One interesting one is that, and it's ple very pleased to see Mark Yetton in here today, um, regards the Alpine Fault. The Alpine Fault ruptures about every 300 to 350 years on average. And yes, the question you're all wanting to know is when did it last rupture? And it last ruptured about 1717. So quick math. Yes, and you'll know that we're well within a window of another rupture of the Alpine Fault. If not within my lifetime, high probability within my children's lifetime. So that's called a conditional probability, where we know we can't put an exact date on it, <laughs> or even an exact decade on it, but we know that we are certainly within a period in the next 100, 50 to 100 years when we can expect a rupture of the Alpine Fault, or that there's a high probability of that happening. How many times this week and last week have you heard about the one in a 100 year, one in a 500 year event? If there's two slides that you're going to take away with you today, this is the second one. When we talk about a one in a hundred year event, it simply means that there is a 1% chance, it's very small, 1% chance of an event happening in any one year. But if we expand that out, as that table shows there, to a 70 year period, which is what I used to use as an average lifespan, which is now a little bit longer than that, um, you can see that for a one in a hundred year event, there is a one chance in two of that size event happening over a 70 year period. In other words, there's a 50% chance of that event happening. So when you hear about these one in a hundred year events, they sound very improbable, very rare, but they're not. So there is a misconception and there is a poor understanding of that. And I can talk in more detail about that and give you examples if you wanted to catch up with, with me later. Very briefly on this, because this is a topic that Tony's going to talk a little bit more about to you. Risk, there's a whole range of ways that we, we, we deal with it. Um, and the way that we view it in terms of its, its, its acceptability or that it's in, unacceptable or somewhere in between there's a tolerability. That tolerability zone or band is very wide and there are a lot of decisions that need to go into a decision on whether something's located somewhere or we carry out some activity before you can d clearly define what tolerable risk actually is. But that diagram will just give you a little idea as to the ranges that we meet with and that we work with and where we may need to set thresholds to be able to establish what would be a tolerable range of risk for people. The whole term acceptable risk is really provocative and who are we to tell you what's acceptable risk and who are we to tell future generations what's acceptable risk as well. So there is a lot of there are there is a lot of detail and thought that needs to go into making those sorts of decisions. Most of our work is based around a very risk-based approach. That diagram there is just to illustrate to you there are steps that we take to reach the decisions that we make. We establish the context, we understand the hazard right through to treating the risks. And as part of that model, we monitor and re review and we consult and communicate. These are things which may not have been done so well in the past, but we're acutely aware of the need to do them in the future. The last, or the second to last part of my presentation and my 20 minutes is almost up, 
um, ways to manage risk. There are three main, main ways that we manage risk. We can modify the natural event, we can reduce our exposure or our vulnerability to it, or we can minimise the consequences. Just before I talk about that, and I'm sure I've heard Roger and others mention this, say this many times before, we need to return our, our lives, our communities to normality as quickly as possible. Yes, we do for very good for some very good reasons, but also my answer to that is no, we don't for some very good reasons as well. We don't always want to reoccupy the areas that we've previously occupied. It's not that we've made mistakes as such in occupying those areas in the past, it's that we haven't fully understood what the nature and the extent of some of the events may be. So returning things to normality is a very uh, good position, uh, a, a, a good approach, particularly from a government level. From a more local level, we're concerned about ensuring that we're not going to repeat some of those mistakes again in the future. Modify the natural event. That's the first of the three I just mentioned. There are physical things that we can do. That first example there is building sand fences on a beach. That helps build up the sand. The, the dunes get become higher and broader and the beach settlements may be safer from flooding. Stop banks. We have a love affair. We've had a love affair with stop banks in this country. They're tangible. We can walk along them like you could in that photo there. You can see the flood waters on one side. You can see the dry land on the other but they're not always the answer. And it's always going to be a combination of these three things that I'm talking about now that's going to deliver, deliver the best outcome for a community. We've tended to rely a lot in the past on physical or, uh, engineering works to give us levels of protection. There are always flood events in this case which are larger um, than what the banks are designed to, to hold back. There are always breaches of the flood bank can always be breaches of these um, stop banks at even lower floods as well. So it's only part of the solution. We can reduce a vulnerability or an exposure through warnings, public education initiatives, engineering design of buildings, hazard maps that we use to assist land use planning decisions and things like that as well. And the third one there is we can minimise the consequences of a disaster. The example there shown is a tsunami response plan for the port of Littleton. So we can't stop these events happening. Tsunami is a very good example of that. We can't stop them happening. We're not going to build protection works, well not in New Zealand, the Japanese have to stop tsunamis to keep the water away from the people. But we can have response plans in place so that when we do know that a tsunami is on its way, we can take some measures to reduce losses and hopefully reduce loss of life as well. Finishing up now, roles and responsibilities. The purpose of these next three slides is not to talk in any detail whatsoever about these. It's purely to illustrate to you that in terms of the legislation, pre-earthquake and post-earthquake, there is a lot of different pieces of legislation that the Council, ECAN and other organisations work under. They all have specific parts to them which help us do our job. These pieces of legislation, nothing sits over the top of each other, they sit next to each other, but as a Council and people who work in this area, we need to be able to balance the provisions of, those le of that legislation to be able to do our jobs adequately. Post September 2010, so they were all sort of peacetime and, and continue to be pieces of legislation that we work under. Post sept September 2010, there's some examples of some of the new plans and strategies or programs that we currently work under as well. And again, just to illustrate that point, there are a lot of organisations involved under all these different pieces of legislation and it's our responsibility, our job is to be able to work together with those other organisations to ensure that we're achieving the, those objectives. And my second to last slide again just illustrates that point. Um, 
dealing with it from both the response, the initial earthquake response phase through to the recovery, through to where we are now with both and into the future with reduction in readiness. So lots of different pieces of work and programs that we have to, um, I, uh, that we identify and work with to achieve those long-term objectives. Just on at the bottom of that diagram, as a little bit of an extra, I suppose, we're heading into a period of reduced seismicity, and you would have heard people talking about that. That is absolutely true with regard to the Canterbury sequence of earthquakes that we've had. But it's not true in terms of our more regional focus as well, and I, I touched on that regarding the Alpine Fault earthquake and other earthquake sources as well. And the other thorn in, in, in the future of Christchurch is definitely climate change and all the changes that that's going to bring, particularly in our coastal areas, but also with regard to flooding, terrestrial flooding as well. So I'm going to leave you with that nice little quote of acceptable risk and hand over to Marion Gadsby. Thank you. I'm uh, Marion Gadsby from um, Environment Canterbury Regional Council. So the responsibility for hazards is actually shared between us and the city and district councils. Um, and the way it works is that we, whoops, we um, set the overall sort of framework, the, the high level sort of principles for the whole region um, in the regional policy statement and then the district and city council take those guide, that guidance and they knot out the details of how the hazard's going to be managed in their district or, or city. Um, our other role is as um, information providers, and again, this is a shared role. So we go out and, and for example, we might commission a, a big report on liquefaction. Uh, or the city might do one on the Port Hills, and then we, we work together in applying that information within district and city plans, but also we work, I work quite closely with um, civil defence around response planning too. We've got a fair bit of information on the website, and um, I do encourage you to go and have a look in there, especially if I've got to talk quick. Right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tsunami hazard, and this is one thing that he, he can, well, Christchurch City's done some work on it too, um, and um, there are a number of different approaches. Um, so there, you, can, you can look at what's happened in the past, so that's a historical approach. You can look at what's happened in the even further back past, so you can have a look at paleo tsunami, what deposits are left in, in the ground, and the University of New South Wales has been working with us quite closely on that. Um, we've got some work commissioned uh, within Littleton Harbour, Birdlings Flat, um, and along the spit there, um, coming up. And then you can do modelling. So you can um, think about how, what sets off an earthquake and model it for what consequences that will have, and then compare that to what you've seen. So that's the approach we've got. So I'm only going to talk about earthquake-generated tsunamis. So what happens is you get an earthquake, as you know, the ground moves. If, it's, if it happens under the sea and the sea floor rises, then it also lifts a body of water up. And that body of water then sets off as a wave across the ocean. Now, it's not a wave that goes like that, and so it washes in and washes out. It's actually a wave that is up and it stays up. And so when that washes in, it washes in and it can't wash out again because it's still washing in. So it's actually like a, a big raising of sea level altogether. It's not just a wash in, wash out thing. And that's why tsunamis have um, a big effect. I'm not going to show you any pictures of Japan. We are not in the same situation as Japan. Let's have a look at what our um, hazard is in Christchurch. <laughs> the, now, my picture of this has got a nice pie chart. Unfortunately, yeah, it's not shown up on the slide. So what, what this was about was um, showing where the, the sources are likely to be. And 
As you can see from my little picture here, we've got a huge chunk of the pie is, whoops, is Peru, Central Chile, North Chile. So our biggest hazard um, is coming from uh, South America. And then we've got a couple of good ones in New Zealand. So we've got the Wairarapa North Fault in Wellington, and we've got the, um, uh, the Hikarangi off the, off the North Island. Okay. So most of, most of the quakes, uh, if you're talking about distant source um, tsunami, it's going to happen around the rim here. But this we've just identified is, is our biggest hazard. And about every 50 years, you get a decent quake on here. And I'm talking 8.5 and above. This particular event was the 2010 Chile tsunami. And as you can see, the energy radiates across the ocean. And when it happens here, most of the energy actually goes off up above New Zealand. But we did get some fingers of waves coming across towards us as well. It wasn't a very huge one, this. It was a magnitude 8.8. .8. Um, but this is what it did at Governor's Bay. So this is what it, this particular wave, of course, they're not just one wave. We, most people seem to know now that it's more than one wave. It happens over even 24 hours. And this particular wave happened at mid-tide. And, and it, this is, these people got, those people got caught out running, whoops, running for it in, in, in uh, Governor's Bay. Um, if you look at what happened in O'Kane's Bay, up the rivers, uh, it's not just an inundation. With tsunami, you've got to be careful of rivers, currents, the sea doing strange things as well. And so in 1868, this river, three kilometers inland, a bridge was washed away. Two kilometers inland, the water was 10 feet. So that's three meters above what it usually is. So that 2010 tsunami, um, here's what the tide, whoops, keep doing that. Here's what the tide should have been doing, and here's what happened when the tsunami hit. Now, as you know, sometimes the water washes out first, so the sea level dropped. And at this point, in Littleton Harbour, there were boats sitting on the seafloor. So that's what that meant. And then the biggest wave hit mid tide and then it carried on for a while. Now, if that one had hit at high tide, that's, where we would have been, that's what we would have been looking at. So we were very lucky. So even though this is only a relatively small tsunami, that's um, what would have happened in Littleton. You would have had a, a good um, few meters on, on top of that. That's what happens when it, co when it comes from Chile. It shoots off to the north. This one was 1960 down here. But when it happens in Peru, it actually shoots towards New Zealand. So these ones are actually riskier for us. And that big one, the, the 9.5 in, in 1960, that's what it did. That was low tide at Littleton, water piling over into the dry dock, which means that the water was way above what it usually is at high tide. So again, very, very lucky. This is actually modeling that's been done on that 1868 quake um, for the Christchurch area. And this is done um, for the topography that's, that's, um, that we have now post-2011. Post, um, as you can see, um, so this is a magnitude 9.1. Um, apparently, we get one of these every 100 or 200 years, something like that. Um, and you can see that for, for this area here, we're looking at up to a sort of a 4.5 meter wave at coast. OK. And you can see that the first, here's the first wave. The second wave's the big one in this case. And it goes on for up to 24 hours. What does that mean when it washes ashore? Well, it depends when it hits. If it hits at low tide, this is what you get. If it hits at high tide, well. Look at this, that's Sumner. That's 2.5 meters of water in Sumner. Um, if it hits somewhere in between, then you get something somewhere in between. And notice what's, what's interesting to me here is that the water isn't coming in this way. It's actually coming in around the back and over here. Those dunes that we've got through here 
are modelled in this as if they are keeping the water out. And, and observations do show that that happens, but um, we've also seen Peter's picture of what happened with the storm surge in the dunes as well. So this is um, assuming the dunes stay intact. So uh, the other sources that we have are um, the Hikarangi, which is it's, a, it's our very own subduction zone that comes on down through here, becomes the Alpine Fault, and then the Puska. So this one tends to send um, tsunami off in this direction here, so not too bad for us down here. But that subduction zone comes around here, and if, it, if you get one set off through here, then that's setting it much more straight towards us. The inundation pattern would be different coming from this direction as well. And we've got some modeling planned to see what that does in the coming year. So we'll know more about what the effects of that are. These local faults are also possible sources, but the modeling says that these are much more likely to give much smaller, um, much smaller tsunami. But nonetheless, if you do feel an earthquake that lasts for more than a minute, and if you do feel an earthquake that's so, stand you can't, so strong you can't stand up, we still say, move inland, move up, okay? And really, we're just trying to, to know our hazard so that we can make response plans and we can start thinking about, well, perhaps putting a tsunami in with the multi-hazards thing where you're getting that coastal erosion, that coastal inundation for other reasons. Think about tsunami as well. Do we want to put some measures in? This sort of modeling can be used for all sorts of things, but then there's a the civil defense thing as well. And don't go and look, don't go down to the beach. If there's a tsunami warning out, there is a certain amount of natural selection in that, of course. But um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I've not, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I want to talk about this thing called risk. More and more of the decisions on big issues, not just in relation to natural hazards, but lots of other things in life, are being made on the basis of risk. Everybody thinks a bit like Humpty Dumpty, they know exactly what risk is, but very often they're all thinking quite different things. So what I want to do, have I got to, I presume Alan Clara will move it on. I want to talk a little bit about what risk is and how we measure it and use it as a measure for safety and other things. Um, and then I'd like to talk very briefly about how we go about estimating risks, and you can hear more about this in the context of slope collapse. But part of what I'm doing here is not just enabling you to understand the process, I'm trying to give you a feel for what sort of information you get out of this, and what it is and what it isn't like, and what you can and can't do with it. And then I'll talk a bit about making decisions about risk and whose job that ought to be um, and what some of the principles that we use when making decisions about safety risk. Again, not just in natural hazards in New Zealand, but all over the world in different walks of life. So let me start by asking you a question. Which of those cathedrals is higher? Right, hands up for the old one. Hands up for the new one. Lot of don't knows. I have seen people take a show of hands like that. Three said the newer, one said the older. I've seen people say there's a 75% chance that it's that one, and there's a 25% chance it's that one. Now, we don't know is the simple answer in, in here, but what we do know, we all know what we mean by height. I could have put tallness in there, which might have made it a little bit clearer, to make that meant from the bottom of the building to the top, not which is higher above sea level. We, we know what height is. We know some units to measure it. And we might not be able to take a tape measure and do it ourselves, but we know that there are lots of ways of measuring it very, very accurately. If we wanted to, we could make a rough estimate to the nearest metre quite quickly, and we could get somebody to go and make a much, much more accurate estimate to the nearest centimetre or millimetre or fraction of a millimetre. And if someone came along and said, I'll tell you, that cardboard cathedral is about 30 times higher than the old one, you would all instantly know I was lying or cheating somehow. Now I'm going to ask you which is safer. I'm really sorry about that. I put that down. <laughs> so now, if I now ask you a question like which is safer, cycling or walking? Let me qualify that in New Zealand. Um, 
all those things that went with your understanding about height probably no longer apply. I won't bother doing the show of hands here, because if you had any sense, you'd be asking me, well, what do you mean, which is safer? Um, there is no longer a unique way of measuring this. We no longer know, instinctively, each of us, six ways we could go and test it. We might not be able to measure it, let alone to the nearest centimetre. We might not get to the nearest metre or the nearest ten metres. What are the units that we're going to measure it in? Um, so let's move on and think about some units we might use. Let's start by looking at how many people get killed cycling and walking. Total deaths in New Zealand over five years up to 2011. Uh, nearly, well, certainly more than three times, nearly four times as many pedestrians killed as cyclists. So if you're someone in the Ministry of Transport trying to reduce road accident casualties, pedestrians are your bigger priority. It's the bigger issue. More people are dying. But that's not telling me anything about what I'm going to experience if I'm going to go and do some cycling or walking in New Zealand. And that's what bothers me. So what I want to know is, well, how much of it was going on? Uh, so if I do some of it, how much risk am I going to bear? So let's now look at something else. How many hours a year were spent doing them? Ah, now we see nearly 10 times as many hours were spent walking as cycling. You can tell what's going to come next, can't you? So if I now look at the deaths per hour that we spend doing it, so perhaps I'm someone thinking about what the implications of encouraging people to take aerobic exercise, spending an hour a day walking or an hour a day cycling. Ooh, now they've swapped around. Cycling is more dangerous per hour spent, nearly twice, more than twice as dangerous as walking. But what if I'm thinking about letting my kids cycle or walk to school and making a choice there? What I'm worried about there is how would the risk compare over that journey? I'm more interested in not how long it takes, but the distance they're travelling. Oh, look. There's more kilometres walked than cycled, but nothing like the same difference there was for the time spent. And sure enough, they're not that different if you look at it per kilometre spent. Now, the key point I'm making here is... There is no right measure of safety or of risk. And you need to tailor the measure that you're using to the situation that you're in and the context of the decision that you want to make. And, it's, and it will be different. And I could uh, just point out those are population averages over the whole of New Zealand. They vary by about a factor of 10 either way, depending if you're male or female, what age you are, what social and economic class you come from. Um, risk is a very inequitably shared out thing in society, I'm sad to say. So my, my key point here is that if someone comes along to you and says, I'm going to tell you about risk, start out by being a little bit cynical. What risk are they talking about? To whom? How are they measuring it? What units are they using? Because until they tell you those things, they haven't told you anything. Uh, Mark Twain said something about lies, damn lies, and statistics, and I wish he'd been here to say something suitable about risk, because it can just go to another plane altogether when it comes to lying and cheating. So generally speaking, we tend to define a measure for safety, if we're interested in safety, in terms of how many bad things happen per unit of something that, happened, that goes on. So we might be looking at deaths, or we might be looking at dollar losses, we might be looking at injuries. But, but in order to actually make some comparisons and get a feel for what it means for me, we need to normalise it per unit of population or time or activity, how many kilometres we cycle, whatever. Um, and when we're looking at, at safety to, of life, we're still not into unique measures because we could look at different sorts of nasty things happening. How many people are killed? What's the chance someone will get killed in an earthquake? Or what's the chance I will get killed in an earthquake? They're very, very different. Someone in New Zealand, is there's a 50% chance someone will die on the roads by the end of today. But there's only a one in a few million chance that it'll be one of us. And because you're the sort of people that come to something like this, you're actually probably already in the category that's a factor of five below the average uh, risk, so you're probably even better than that. <laughs> now, when we come to look at people at home, um, that there are some quite good precedents in lots of other walks of life, we need to be looking at a measure that makes sense at the individual level. 
It's what experience are people having is the first thing I'm worried about. Not how many people are dying. That's a very, very important measure if we're looking at what's it worth investing to stop people dying. But the first thing for me is what's the risk to me and my family? And that's where this measure that's been quoted and bandied about a lot in the Port Hills context comes from. It's, it's what's the chance of me dying per year? Um, and we can compare that with other things that give us a chance of dying per year and get some sort of feel for how worried we might want to be about it. But at the end of the day, as I'll come on to in a moment, it's, it's not what I think is worrying that matters, it's, it's what you think. Because I'm not the people at risk in the Port Hills, and some of you probably are. First of all, we have to characterise all the possible scenarios that could lead to slopes collapsing. Um, that includes earthquakes and severe weather and other things. And then for each one of them, we have to estimate how often that scenario gets triggered, how often we get an earthquake that big, as opposed to an earthquake that big or that big. Then we have to look at how much rock's going to fall off. Now you can imagine that's not going to be a terribly precise science, but we've learned a huge amount from the recent Canterbury earthquakes. How far out is that rock going to fall? How far back at the top of the cliff is it going to whittle off? What's the chance that someone at a house I'm interested in, my house, is in the way. And what's the chance, if they are, that they get killed? So you have, to, you have to work out all those things and add up over all those scenarios to get an estimate of that annual risk to me at my house. Now, I think you can see straight away those things are not going to be things we can work out exactly to the nearest millimetre. They're going to be pretty fuzzy and uncertain. And you can also see straight away, they're not things that ordinary folks are going to know a lot about. You're going to need some expert knowledge to estimate the risk. And there's been a lot of expert knowledge uh, gone into this uh, from GNS Science and lots and lots of geologists and geotechnical people. So that's estimating the risk. But that's only the first step of thinking about the risk and assessing it and understanding it. Um, the next step is deciding what to do about it. And I think that's really what we're here to talk about today. Um, you know, how worried should I be about a one in 10,000 risk of me or my children dying each year? Some people will undoubtedly say, well, that's, I face that risk on the roads every day. Shrug. I can live with that. I'll get on with it. Others will say, I want to take that red zone off and be out of here faster than you can imagine. So different people will be worried to different levels. Here's a huge issue. Who should decide how safe is safe enough? Should it be left to the individual to decide? Should the council be making a decision? What's happened in this case is central government has essentially made a decision and said, we think the risk in some homes is so high, we're prepared to spend taxpayers' money to buy their houses and get them out of there. Wow. But then what could and should we do? What are our options? Uh, what's affordable? What's practicable? What does everyone want? You know, th these are not, you know, risk decisions are not about getting some numbers and putting them on a scale and saying if it's below there, it's this, and if it's above there, it's that. You know, numbers do not make decisions. We've, we have to make choices um, and we have to talk about it to decide what we want. And the key thing I really want to bring out here is Experts estimate the risk for you, but you should never, ever, ever let experts make the decisions for you. That is a democratic task. And it just isn't possible, unfortunately, to ask every single individual in Christchurch what they'd like to do. The council is in the position of having to try, on your behalf, to balance everybody's interests and come out with the best decisions. So, we've talked about what risk is, we've talked about how we get the information, and I think you can tell already it's fuzzy sort of information, it's not crisp and clear. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about making decisions. Let's look generically at how we try and relate our response to the risk. And when the risk is to do with safety and lives, typically there are two components to this. The first thing we might do is say, I'm going to draw a line in the sand as I go up the risk scale I'm going to get to some level of the risk that individuals are experiencing, and I'm just going to say, I am not prepared to go there. Yeah, we as a society are not prepared to tolerate people being put at risk beyond that. We, uh, that's intolerable. Um, we're just not prepared to live with that. We must, if we can't reduce it, we either have to get the people out of there or stop doing whatever it is that's causing it. It, it just has to stop. 
Now, below that, we might be worried about it, and we might definitely want to reduce the risk, but we can, what we're kind of saying is, if we have to, we can live with it there. And that means we'd, we'd like to reduce it, but we recognise that it's not going to take, we are not going to spend the whole budget of Christchurch reducing this risk. We've got lots of other things we want to do. There may be lots of other areas we could spend money and save more lives. Uh, so it's going to end up being put in a balance with other things that we want to do. And we're going to have to debate and thrash out the way forward with it. Um, and there may, as Peter was saying, be a lower level below which it's minimal, and we don't need to do anything particular except keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't start creeping up to a worrying level again. So how does that relate to where the, we are in Christchurch? Basically, the way I see it is the red zone offers a, set, a government saying, we don't want people at those levels of risk to life. I'm talking particularly about the risk to life in the Port Hills here, rather than of, of your building being damaged in the liquefaction area. So we've had, in a way, you might even say, we've, we've done the easy bit. We had lots of central government resources, lots of politicians keen to show they'd resolved the issues, ready to put some big national public money in to help us define some houses that were bad enough that we would actually buy them off people and get them out of there. But now we're moving on to the next part. You know, surely, if it's, if it's so bad above that top dotted line, we'd buy everyone's houses. Um, we want to be a little bit careful, very careful, about letting too many more people get up near that dotted line. So when we're thinking forward into the future, I would expect that we're going to be looking at you know, consent is going to be a really vital process, to, not just to stop more people getting into red zone levels of risk, but stopping too many people getting into the levels a bit below that. Hopefully, making sure that most of the development is happening further down uh, the risk scale. Uh, and that's, that's a reactive process. That's the way the council responds to the things other people want to do. But there's also going to be proactive processes that the council has the opportunity to progress through planning. Perhaps we can propose future land uses for high-risk areas which don't involve putting people at risk um, and try and focus development where people are going to live and work all of the time and visit all of the time into areas that are freer uh, of risk. And another very important thing I think that uh, Christchurch is going to have to do is, is monitor the risks. They are going to change. They are going to evolve. Um, so we need to keep an eye on them. So to summarise, uh, you really need to be careful what you mean when you're talking about risk. You have to define it carefully and be specific. Risk estimation needs special expertise, and the information you get out is uncertain. We've, I think we've said, Chris, for the, uh, the Port Hills risk information, we're typically saying it's, it's give or take about a factor of 10 either way. So when we say it's about a 1 in 10,000 risk, it could be 1 in 1,000, or it could be 1 in 100,000. That makes decisions that much harder. Um, decisions about risk are not to be left to experts. Decisions about risks are for the people who are at risk and the, who are affected by, not just by the risks themselves, but by what we do about them. And you know, we've seen a lot of discussion and debate about the red zone offers, there's going to be a lot of people very upset when they find that their land that isn't red zoned isn't going to be welcomed having residential building on in the future. Those people are not, by and large, going to be quiet, timid. That's fine, council people. They're going to stand up and make a big fuss about it. And if we don't establish good policies now, we'll find ourselves in 10, 20, 50 years' time in the situation I think the council was in before the earthquakes, of receiving planning applications for housing in what to me a non-expert frankly look daft places, saying no to granting consent and being overturned in the environment court because there wasn't a clearly stated policy and criteria for being able to say no. So, uh, Good decisions do tailor the response to the risk if you can. I know it might seem awfully hard and analytical to try and base your response on this very technically stuff to do with risk, but honestly, it's a lot better than not doing it. Um, it. It's the best way to save more lives with the budget you've got, is to try and use the evidence and the risks. 
And finally, I just want to say that you know, we end up always in safety with these really key decisions, which I think are going to be very, very important going forward. How safe is so risky that we're just not prepared to tolerate it? And we collectively will help the people that are up there, stranded up there, if you like, um, get out of there. And then how are we going to balance this risk reduction with our other priorities? How are we going to value getting 100 houses down in risk by a factor of 10 against the wish to spend money on better services. Thanks very much.